Hello, Hershey's Mennonite Church. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, the sermon that I'm, I'm going to preach, it, it was supposed to be on legalism, but as I sat down and started writing out what I wanted to say, the way that the sermon developed made it less about legalism and more about how God is our Father, which I think is the opposite of legalism. Um, so um, I think it was seven years ago, I was sitting with a, uh, a preacher, and, and he told me something. He said, legalism is Christianity's worst enemy. And I wish I would have asked him in that moment to define terms, because I had no idea what he meant. Um, I, wish, I wish he could have talked me through what exactly he meant. So since that moment, I've had quite a bit of time to think about what legalism is and what it's not. But I'm actually just going to talk about the opposite of legalism, namely what it's not. And what it's not is to see God as our Father. Seeing God as our Father is a scandal. It's a scandal to the world. It's a scandal to look at God and say, God is our Father. And I'm going to start by reading. The, uh, um, it is, is a scandal because... Human beings made from dust that return to dust look at a holy, perfect God, the creator of the universe, and call him our Father, us imperfect beings. And that is, I believe, much of what separates one who is legalistic from one who is not. And I'll explain more about that later. So, Ephesians chapter 2, now, it doesn't mention God as our, doesn't explicitly say God is our Father in this text, but as you will see from this sermon, I hope to show you how God's attributes show him as a Father in this text. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. From a cursory reading of these 10 verses, you may notice the differences of how humanity is described and how God is described. Um, the, the believers were dead in sin, some called sons of disobedience. Others, they were called by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Then it repeats, when we were dead in our trespasses, the gospel, as Timothy Keller puts it, brings humanity down to the dust. When a man refers to Jesus as good teacher, Jesus tests him by saying, why do you call me good teacher? No one is good except God alone testing if that man believed in who Jesus really was. In Psalm 130, it says, if you would mark faults, who could stand before you? If you would mark faults, oh God, who could stand before you? The other character in this passage is, well, characters, 
God and Christ, character, characters, either way. Obviously, so God, as shown as the hero in this passage, bringing to life, gives grace, works in us, gives us work to do. He is the hero and the savior in this passage, much like the rest of the Bible. So humanity and God are contrasted in this passage. So there are three ways, my three points, that God is our father. God is our father, so he gives us life. God is our father, so he lavishes his love on us. And God is our father, so he gives us chores to do. Firstly, God is our father because he gives us life. Obviously, we know in the physical world that both men and women play a large role in the creation of new life. Here we are talking about God. Here we are talking about God who brings us from death to life. Or there, some people describe it as born again. The word in verse 1, dead, in Greek, it means dead. A dead person. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> A dead person lacks the ability to stand or to save himself or come to life. He even lacks the ability to move. Much like a dead person, a person who is dead in sin lacks the moral capacity to respond to God. Augustine once said, you cannot obey God without God. You cannot obey God. Morally, it is morally impossible to respond to God unless God himself brings you from death to life. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you, Christ says in John chapter 6. God brings us to life in Christ. In Ezekiel, possibly one of the most offensive books in the Old Testament at least, um, God's, um, it's written, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. In other words, your parents were idolaters. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. Now listen to verse 6. And when I passed by you, and I saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. In your blood, I said to you, live. God brings to life, from death to life, those who are cast off, abhorred. He brings from death to life. He is our Father in that he gives us life. He made us, as it says later in the verse, alive with Christ. I am not of the mind. I believe that true, a tr- an encounter with God, where God brings one from death to life, I am not saying one will become perfect, but I do say that I believe it creates a significant change in direction in somebody's life. I am far from perfect. But when you see the rad- radical words that Paul and Jesus and prophets used to describe repentance and turning to Yahweh, turning to Christ, the conversion, ex- well, I don't want to say conversion experience, that's not the right word. The conversion, the fundamental direction and change that happens is significant. Second, God lavishes his love on us. 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Let's look at verse 6 and 7 again. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So not only have we been made alive with Christ, have we passed from death and lo- to life with Christ, but God loved us so much as to seat us in the heavenly places with Christ. What great love God has lavished on us that we would s- sit in places where prince- princes and princesses sit. Illegitimate children don't sit with the king. Illegitimate children of God don't sit with God. Legitimate children sit with the king. Children who have been born of God, truly born of God, have God's life within them, his Holy Spirit. They sit with God. What love has God lavished on us that you and I, sons of Adam, born, created from dust and ash, would take part in the governance of the universe with our prayers because we are sitting in the heavenly places with Christ. Let me repeat that. What love has God lavished on us that people such as us, sinners from dust that we have come, the dust from the dust that we have come would be seated in the heavenly places with Christ and our prayers would be taken into account for the governance of the entire world and universe. What great love God the Father has lavished on us because we are his legitimate children. We are God's legitimate children. And the two phrases before and after that, by grace you have been saved. And this is not by works, not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. All of this that we receive, that we are seated in the heavenly places, that we have been brought from death to life, is by grace and gr- grace, by grace through faith alone. Now, what, why, why is this such an important phrase? Why? I, I have gone through much of my life, um, and I, I was wondering why, and I, much of my younger years were spent when I would think about religion, which wasn't that much, I would wonder about this question. Why is this so, so important? Why, is there, why do people keep telling me there's such a big difference between a, what they called a works-based faith and what they called a faith that depends on God's grace and God's gifts? And the answer that I, I have now come up with is it distorts God's character. God's character is vastly distorted when we think we can earn our salvation. And this is why. It's the same difference, it's the same difference between a father and an employer. When you work for your employer, you expect him to pay you. But there might not be any love between you and your employer. You work for your employer, and if you don't work for your employer, you lose your job. If I would decide tomorrow not to show up at Hoover's, well, sorry, tomorrow, I don't work at Hoover's tomorrow. Tuesday, 
if I decided Tuesday that I just wasn't going to show up at Hoover's at all, I would probably lose my job without telling them, without telling anyone, I would lose my job. Um, because Hoover's love is dependent on how I work for them. So it's not actually love. There is a vast difference between working for your employer and receiving gifts from your father. God is not your employer. God is not your employer. God is your father. God's love isn't going to disappear tomorrow if you don't show up to work. If I don't show up to Hoover's on Tuesday, which I will, but if I don't, God's not going to stop loving me. If, uh, if I tell my dad I'm going to mow the lawn, and I don't mow the lawn, I don't think my dad would stop loving me. I don't... <laughs> Do you understand? I, I, I hope I'm being clear. Is this, is this clear? Is this, this is very, very important. Is God our Father that gives us gifts that seated us in the heavenly places because he loves us and he's our father who brought us from death to life because he loves us and he's our father or is he our employer that is that if we don't show up to work on Tuesday is going to fire us he is not our employer he is not our employer we have been born to a new life we are his children now and his love is not fickle. His love is not fickle. Um, and the third, the third and final way that God is our Father for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He gives us chores. Now, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Don't put the cart before the horse. The horse is grace, and that's pulling the cart of works. You understand? So if you put grace behind the cart of works, that doesn't work. You understand? Don't put, the horse, don't put the cart before the horse. Put the, the, the horse before the cart. You understand what I'm saying? You're following me. The horse, which is God's grace, pulls other things along with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, good. This is very important. It's very important. God, God gives us works to do. He gives us chores that he then does with us. He loves us so much, and he created us not only to be with him, but so that we might work with him. Now, I... This, this verse... Let me, let me think about how I want to say this here. Legalism, legalism will say always, as we discussed before, I can earn my father's love. But this is completely different. This is God. We are Christ's. We are co-labors with God in Christ, as the scripture says. We work together with him. We have a calling. God has he has brought us to life. He has seated us in the heavenly places. He has given us everything we need. And now he has, he has shaped us and formed us so that we can do his works, the works of God. He has brought us from death to life. He has created a change within us. And now... We do his work, the works of our Father, because he has put his love within us. 
So, I don't think I went long enough. <laughs> the three. God is our Father, so He gives us life. God is our Father, so He lavishes His love on us. And God is our Father, so He gives us chores. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are our Father. We thank you that you give us life, that you, you love us unconditionally. We thank you that we can say with, with no guilt or no, uh, with no, that we can call you Father. We thank you in the in the name of your uh, in the name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen.